have you noticed that politicians struggle to enact the things they run on? That regardless of who wins elections, lawmakers find they cannot pass whatever legislation they like. They find themselves bound by what is popular or at least their sense of it. They can only enact things within a narrow set of ideas, and that range is called the Overton Window. And on the Overton Window podcast, we look at issues around the country and talk to the people who change what is politically possible. Now, lawmakers in every state give cash and other favors to select businesses and say that it's about winning the future of jobs. Their boasts wither away under a modicum of scrutiny. And in response, some lawmakers are trying to prevent basic public transparency about their deals by signing non-disclosure agreements to stop people from knowing about favors before contracts are signed. Now, Pat Garofalo is trying to keep public deal-making public information. He is the director of state and local policy at the American Economic Liberties Project, where he criticizes concentrated economic power. Pat, welcome. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. Uh, what is going on with non-disclosure agreements about business subsidy negotiations? That is a that is a fantastic question. So as I'm sure your listeners are very familiar with and anyone who's followed uh, your organization is familiar with, um, elected leaders all over the country make uh, corporate subsidy deals with specific corporations, handing them money for, in theory, specific investments that lead to economic prosperity, right? Build a factory here, build a distribution center there, we'll give you some money, it will create jobs, everyone will be happy. That's not how it works in practice, right? The vast bulk of both academic work and just kind of the common community experience for folks in the places where these deals go down is that they aren't actually beneficial for the economy. The job creation that's uh, promised doesn't materialize. The investments don't pan out. Uh, but a lot of money goes out the door that could go to pay for basic services and kind of the general business of government. So instead of rethinking this model and doing economic development differently, uh, what corporations and the elected leaders who favor them have taken to doing is hiding this sort of deal making. And one of the tactics they use to hide it is a non-disclosure agreement. Now, folks are probably most familiar with these in an employment context. You sign an NDA with your employer saying that you will not disclose certain things about the business. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about contracts between elected leaders, people who are in public office doing public service, and private corporations that prevent those elected leaders from disclosing the terms of their deal making with the public. If that sounds outrageous and corrupt, it's because it is. <laughs> well, that's the thing that surprises me that these even exist, because just on the uh, just looking on the outside, it doesn't seem right. Like a politician who, or, who signs this has got to think that there is a political liability associated with this, is that if it gets out, it will become un or people will learn about it and they will criticize me for it. And most lawmakers have to run for office don't like criticism. But yet they see like that this is an asset. Can you explain what that asset is that would make them take this risk? So I think there's two two parts to that. The first is that you're absolutely right in your sense of the politics of these agreements in isolation. Every time, and I've been working on this for quite a few years now, every time I explain to just like a normal person, you know, on the street uh, <laughs> that these agreements exist, the most common reaction is shock that it's even legal. <laughs> Right, that they, they, it blows people's minds that this is even a practice that is allowed under current law. How can it be that someone I voted into office can sign an agreement with a private corporation saying they can't tell me what they're doing with public resources? Right, that can't, you know, it they, they can't possibly be legal. How is that even possible? Um, so, so I think that's true that in the in isolation, voters do find this practice outrageous. That is offset by the benefits that accrue to politicians from corporate subsidy deal making. Um, and I'm sure you're very familiar with and anyone who's listened to the show is familiar with the academic work showing that the reason one of the reasons that corporate subsidy deal making persists is because the political capital built is actually useful in future elections. And that makes sense if you think about it. Politician, when they make one of these deals in the kind of immediate term, is able to put out a press release saying they created all these jobs. They go to a ribbon cutting and, you know, they do the silly thing with the hard hat and the shovel and you know get their picture on the front page of the local paper they get to tweet about it and put on facebook look at all these things i'm doing for the community and by the time the reality 
sets in that the deal was actually probably pretty bad for the community, it's who knows how many years down the road is that politician even in that office anymore? They have new things they can you know, distract you with. Uh, so folks have kind of forgotten, but the political capital in the immediate short term is actually really worth something. And so that's one of the reasons both the kind of economic development machine persists, but also that these NDAs persist because the political leaders realize that they can accrue the short term political capital and then deal with the any scandal uh, that comes out because of the existence of the agreement down the road. You mentioned that your uh, people are surprised that these non-disclosure agreements are even legal. You're actually mounting an effort to make them illegal. How's that going? We are trying. We are trying. Um, so there's a, a, a group of folks around the country um, in, a, in a few states who have introduced bills to make these uh, agreements illegal under state law. Uh, we've had bills introduced in, and you're going to have to remind me of some because I may forget, uh, New York. Florida, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and Illinois. Um, the one that's gotten the furthest has been in New York. Um, and there's a great champion on this issue in New York State. His name is Senator Michael Giannaris. Um, he has gotten his bill voted out of the New York State Senate twice. And the most interesting thing about this to me is that it has been voted out twice unanimously. So gonna gonna do a little like politicking here, right? On this issue, it doesn't break down really cleanly left, right, R, D, red, blue, as well, exhibited by the fact that I am here as a very liberal dude talking to you, a very conservative dude, and we are like in agreement right on this 100%. It really breaks down on kind of elites and politically connected, usually larger businesses on one side and a kind of economic development bureaucracy. And on the other side, everybody else. <laughs> Right. Uh, local communities, activists, uh, politicians on the left and right, organizations like ours on the left and right. Um, and, and so it, it, the interesting thing in New York, as I circle back around to that point, is that it was voted out unanimously twice. Nobody wanted to vote against this. Every Republican, every Democrat in the New York State Senate two times said, yes, these agreements should be banned. It doesn't move out of the New York Assembly because that's a kind of like older, more machiney, politically like old boys network body in New York State. Um, but it's been encouraging that the two times someone has actually had to like go out and cast a vote on this bill, no one has wanted to vote against it. Uh, so there are great leaders in other states um, who have sponsored this legislation. Um, Rob Green in Indiana, uh, Senator Robert Peters in Illinois, uh, Representative Anna Eskamani down in Florida, Senator Katie Muth in Pennsylvania. This is a bipartisan group as well, um, not all falling on one side of the aisle. Uh, and then uh, there's the kind of infrastructure around it. Both of our organizations are part of a coalition we've put together called Ban Secret Deals um, that uh, works to try and encourage this sort of legislation across the country. Uh, it's still kind of early, right, when you look at uh, policy efforts like this, they take a really, really long time. And we are certainly not helped by a lot of the media coverage or the kind of uh, existence of the economic development bureaucracy and machine uh, in these efforts. But, I, you know, I'm always hopeful. I, I think one of these is going to get across the finish line one day. Yeah. So on this issue, I'm just thinking about where it stands in the Overton window. Um, we have a lot of bills. We can find people to support it. It's not an outrageous idea. In fact, it's probably a pretty popular idea, given the fact that uh, no one's voted against it yet. Uh, and we and my organization and our sister organization have polled this uh, yeah. before. And I mean, it doesn't it shouldn't shock you. This polls off the charts mm -hmm. popular. These these bills, there's there's no question that the general voter and the general community member, when they hear about this issue, think that banning the ability of politicians to sign these binding contracts with corporations should be illegal. Yeah, but that's where the, uh, um, I, I think it's fully politically feasible, um, but there's things that are going on behind the scenes that have kept it from getting a public vote. Uh, and that's the, again, the allure of this deal making, the fact that politicians everywhere can turn uh, giving giving big checks to big businesses into a political asset for them because of the jobs headline. In fact, as you as you noted, there is an army of bureaucrats, of, of people who are ostensibly public officials, as well as business groups in, in particular uh, businesses who are trying to get lawmakers to say yes when they ask for special favors. And so you've got all these people who are saying, look, this is the game. As long as we don't pay attention to critics, 
As long as we simply or we ignore all the academic evidence about how these are bad for the public, uh, we can turn these into assets for you lawmakers. And right now, we haven't quite won enough support and enough attention to get lawmakers to view criticisms of these deals as a political asset. And I think I think it's there. I think we're getting close. Um, but this is that basic concentrated benefits diffuse cost problem. The people who get favors, the people who hand it out, this is a huge part of their livelihood. And us, the public, needs actually public outrage to break through that because they do offer lawmakers something to benefit them. So I guess that's that's the uh, the battle as I see it right now. What are we doing about it? Absolutely. I think that's right. Um, and I think you can't discount the part of what you said, which is that there is some kind of machinery inside government that is helping to grease the skids for these deals. That is a, a, actually a really key obstacle for those of us who want to change things. I, uh, I write a newsletter on Substack called Boondoggle, where I cover issues of corporate power around the country. And I recently wrote a piece about um, a deal for a Amazon data center in Maryland that actually ultimately fell apart under some really excellent organizing by local citizens. They managed to get wind of the deal despite the fact that it was covered by NDAs and stop the project. It's just like agricultural corner of Maryland, about an hour, hour and a half outside of DC. And yeah, a guy who's literally a Christmas tree farmer organized his neighbors and got wind. And they used really clever um, legal tactics, including open meetings law and FOIA to stop this deal. But they shared with me some of the documents they got back through their um, freedom of information and public records requests. And one of the most striking things to me was that the Maryland Department of Commerce was really actively pushing local officials to sign these non-disclosure agreements. So you had the actual apparatus of the government, a, you know, a cabinet, a state cabinet agency uh, working to force ca county and local officials to sign these NDAs. So they had this like department of the state government on their side, Amazon did, pushing these agreements. And it was really, really gross. And actually, there's one instance where one of the like heads of business development in the in the Maryland Department of Commerce fully acknowledged in an email that some of the information that Amazon uh, was submitting should have been made public because it had to do with public rights of way for um, for cables. And he was going around to like the, the, the uh, state attorney general making the argument that even that information shouldn't be public. And this is a guy who works for the state co commerce department, fully acknowledging that the law says this needs to be public. But eh, can we actually make it not public? That'd be really great for me and Amazon. And it was really gross. And so that's an actual really big impediment is that you have to get past those folks who, when these bills get introduced, all flip out and go and scream at the elected officials who introduce them and say, oh, no, you can't do this. It will destroy the economy. All our deal making ability will go away. Blah. And right there, they are actually a giant hurdle and a giant problem. Um, but the, the kind of encouraging thing, I think, is that there have been instances recently of victories that have shown that we are correct. I think if you look at Amazon HQ2 in New York, very famously kind of chased away from Long Island City by, among others, Senator Gene Aris, who sponsors the, the um, NDA ban in New York. Um, and Despite the like, there are still a few people who moan and cry about that. But I, I feel like the consensus is very much moving towards New York dodged a bullet there. Everything is fine. Amazon is still expanding in the state. That deal was a stinker. And then down here, I live in Washington, D.C. And right across the river, we have our uh, in northern Virginia. HQ2 is not providing the benefits that it was supposed to. And and it's you know, it's been suspended. They're not hiring at the rate. Uh, it was supposed to be the hotel revenue that was supposed to materialize hasn't. So we're seeing the opposite. So I think that was actually a big political win in New York for those folks. If you look at Wisconsin, uh, where uh, former Governor Walker arguably lost because of the Foxconn, the deal he made with Foxconn blew up completely. Uh, the current governor, Tony Evers, made a huge deal about that during the campaign and arguably cost Walker his seat. And then down in Louisiana, and this is the most recent one, they a few years ago made a um, several very large, important changes to their main corporate subsidy program. The uh, current Democratic governor made those changes via executive order. He is term limited. The race to replace him is on. And all of his opponents have endorsed those changes and have said that they will keep him 
uh, keep them in place uh, if they were to come into office, um, and including the Republicans. He's a Democrat, but it's likely that a Republican will replace him. And every Republican running for the nomination has said they will keep his changes. So like there is policy victories we can point to and momentum we can point to. It's replicating those and scaling them up and getting them in some places um, that are where this sort of deal making is a lot more entrenched. The Amazon HQ2, I think, was a big public black eye to business subsidy supporters. And I think they've been trying to adapt to this, which is they saw that people didn't like states bidding for a project, competing with each other over who can write the biggest checks. I think that that was something that was distasteful for them. Are these non-disclosure agreements part of that response? 100%. Uh, this is anecdotal. I don't have any data to back this up, but I have seen I, my senses that their use has increased since then, because I think you're exactly right that that was a kind of big, um, like ugly display of how gross a lot of this deal making is. And people understood what was happening and really didn't like it. So yes, I think we are seeing more efforts to keep this sort of stuff out of the public eye since then. Uh, but but honestly, these NDAs, I, there was a there was a deal for Google in uh, San Jose, I want to say like 2016, 2017, um, and an organization FOIA'd the, the records um, for that deal making. And Google was very honest <laughs> with the local uh, economic development bureaucrats in those emails saying, no, we need these NDAs because if we don't, then the rabble is going to find out about this deal and make our life difficult. And like, we can't, we're not here for that. We can't have that. Um, we have a so lot that of is like, public officials against public transparency. Yeah, it was just very explicit. Um, and, and so that, yes, I think you are correct that their use has increased, though it was a tactic that was around beforehand. And honestly, it's the same thing in Maryland with that deal where I uh, where the, the community was able to ultimately um, stop the data center. As soon as Amazon had to realize that it was going to have to argue for this in public, it pulled the plug and was like, no, we're again, we don't do that. Uh, and one more point on that that I think is really important is going back to Louisiana, those reforms that I mentioned. One of the biggest changes they made in Louisiana was that the corporations asking for subsidies now needed to go to the local government bodies that would be affected, the school board, the sheriff's office, and make a public case for their subsidy. And one of the reasons that the use of this subsidy dropped so dramatically is because corporations simply didn't want to do that, so they stopped asking. It's not that they weren't initiating projects. It's not that they didn't, didn't like want the money, but having to go make that public case, they were like, you know what? Nope. It's not worth it to us. We don't want to do that. It's going to get ugly. We're going to get bad press. Blech. Like, we don't, we're not going to do that. And, and that is responsible for one of the largest drops in the use of that subsidy in Louisiana, which is just really interesting. Simply forcing these guys to go public means they just stop asking. Well, I think that's a really important point about this issue in general, which is like uh, what lawmakers say that they're doing is rarely what they're actually doing. Like often you'll see this is work investing in strategic industries that are going to secure the economic futures for our state. What they're actually doing is saying yes when a big company asks for a big check or other favors because it's not all just check writing. You get tax uh, 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 tax exemptions, tax abatements, uh, job training programs. A lot of uh, there are um, special loans. Uh, there's a lot Dis of different discounts ways. on land, discounts on yeah. utilities. There's all sorts of stuff. It, Yes, there's all sorts of stuff. So some of the time, though, it is it is writing big checks. And I think a lot most companies would just prefer to have big checks, but they'll take what they can get. But when they're asking for these deals, if those companies think that there is a chance that lawmakers say no, they won't ask. Uh, uh, because they would look at they would look at that and say, look, there's a risk that this is going to go sideways and we'll get attacked. We'll be in the public. We'll lose a lot of our our public reputation. We'll be cast as the villain of society. They won't ask. They're as gun shy as ever. But the fact that every state does some of these uh, just demonstrates to me that politicians want to hand out special favors. They're primed. They want to get uh, headlines and they don't care necessarily what it costs. Um, so I guess the bigger question that I that I have on the on this is what are uh, what are legislators afraid of in the uh, are, what are legislators afraid to disclose and why? Are they afraid to disclose? I like right. There's a lot of stuff that gets pretty gross when you start looking at these agreements. Oftentimes, this is one of the 
the most um, uh, common facets of these deals is that the jobs number that is being screamed about in the headlines and in the press releases isn't actually what the project is is supposed to create, right? Like they'll say, this company is coming in and is going to create 400 jobs, and then you read the agreement, and actually they get their money if they create 150. Or, well, if they don't create all of those 400 jobs, they'll be able to come back and renegotiate it later. So that's one of the, and there's been academic work around this too, uh, those ability to move the goalposts within these uh, agreements, that's really common. One of the other most common things that I think is is nasty and gross um, is uh, restrictions on um, public records and Freedom of Information Act requests. One of the common facets of the HQ2 deal down here um, in Virginia is that Amazon gets pinged when there's a FOIA request and they basically get the right of first, like they get the first pass at it, uh, where they get to say, oh, this is proprietary information, you can't release it. They get alerted when their public is asking questions about their the public resources that they're receiving. You see that all the time. And right, you can see how like a pile of this stuff would look pretty bad <laughs> for a political actor. Like once you get into the guts of these, they'd really prefer just the headline to exactly your point. They want I created 400 jobs. You are welcome. Here's the ribbon cutting. You know, you can send me a campaign donation later. <laughs> that's what they, that's what they want. They want the tweet. They want the press release. They don't want the details. Cause once you get into the details, and again, this is like, once you start talking to a like normal person about it, they realize how gross it all is. Um, once you get into the details, that's where like the real ugliness is. And that's what they're trying to keep out. And also not for nothing, present, preventing these, presenting these deals as like a fait accompli just makes political organizing impossible you can't organize against something that's done whereas if we know we as like you know activists and um organizations and labor unions and whoever is like trying to organize against a particular project if we know we have two months before a vote right that's a lot of time to get out there and do something and tell people and get media coverage whereas if the deal's just presented to us and oh, it's done it's here hello then there's no time to engage in any of that politics and that's the goal the explicit goal of these ndas and having the the process be not in the public eye is to prevent all of that politicking from happening. Yeah, I think that those are both really good points. Uh, again, just to summarize them, they don't want you to know about this because what they actually require companies to do are going to be different from what they say they're going to do in the headline. They don't want, or they want to prevent the possibility of opposition before deals are signed. And I think there's one other thing I think is important to add on, on this of why lawmakers want this is that they don't always win these projects. Some of the time, these companies are looking for competing officer offers, which means that someone loses and that loser actually has an incentive to try to complain, uh, uh, or, or to cast this company as a villain. And these, uh, non-disclosure agreements demonstrate that, uh, that uh, they're they're not going to get uh, uh, opposition from com or from the states that don't win these win these deals. Absolutely, and one other facet of the NDAs in particular that I find sort of the most problematic is usually these negotiations occur right with a governor or a kind of state economic development um, agency. Uh, but it often the money often has to be authorized by the state legislature. And so you'll get in these, and this is true like if the county, at the county level or at the city level, but I've seen it most often at the state. So you get these absurd debates in state capitals where legislatures are debating deals and considering expending sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars. And they either don't know, and many of them actually do not know, or they cannot say aloud the name of the corporation that is going to benefit. I was watching a debate on this in, in uh, Kansas, and they just kept saying the firm, the firm, the firm, as they were debating this measure for it was like $780 million or something like that mm -hmm. on, on the floor of the state capitol. And it's like, why are they using that funny phrase? That's not something you hear on like a state capitol floor. Like, oh, it's because the people who know that it was going to be Panasonic <laughs> for the record, aren't allowed to say it. But actually, most of them probably legitimately don't know because they aren't read in on the economic development contracts or they weren't willing. Some of them are, some folks aren't willing to sign the NDA and so don't aren't privy to the information. Uh, but literally, they're voting to expend hundreds of millions of dollars without knowing who it's going to. And if you're a state legislator in a big state and you don't know who it's going to, you don't know where it's going. This might not benefit your constituents at all. It may be on the other side of the state where the location is and you 
don't know. And so you're like, well, that actually happened in this in this Kansas debate. Someone was saying this could be in my metro area or it could be clear across the state. And I have no idea how am I supposed to adequately vet this program. But that's what these NDAs do. Yeah. So we policy nerds get criticized by our political communications friends <laughs> uh, for failing to tell a story with a moral. Uh, so let me put this issue a simple way. Your elected officials meet with big companies in secret to negotiate how much of your money they're going to get. That's unfair. It's corrupt. Elected officials are supposed to be on the people's side, and here they are negotiating uh, uh, with some private interest to give them public's, uh, the public's money. And they're hiding their deal making from the public. How'd I do? Oh, great. I, I, I think one other important part of this that's on us and on the general public, right, is to bolster the people who are fighting this practice. Like, if you know in your state that a bill exists, write to the sponsors and say you support it. Tweet at the sponsors and say you support it. Ask your representative or your state senator to introduce one of these bills, because that's ultimately how we're going to change this is to something that you said at the very beginning of this is flipping the political calculus. Right now, the calculus is that eh, it's better to deal to do the deal making and deal with the fallout because that will be better for me politically. But if we flip that and say, oh, actually, it's going to be more costly politically to do the deal than to fight it, then the, the politicians are going to read the writing on the wall and they're going to go where the people push them. And so I think it's really, really important to bolster the champions on this issue where they exist mm -hmm. and to push your own elected officials to become champions on this issue. And I think that's something that is drastically underappreciated in state policy is that normal people have a much stronger voice with your state legislators than you do with your congressmen and clearly than you do with your uh, with the president. Uh, if they hear from regular voters, especially their regular primary voters, that they have noticed this issue especially, or so, any other issue that I think doesn't reach the national stage all that often, you know, you can really change some hearts and minds. It doesn't take that many people. But right now, this is a concentrated benefit and diffuse cost problem where the people who get to write big checks and the people who get to collect big checks have a huge reason to try to make sure that this thing keeps going and, and uh, keeps going in secret. And, uh, uh, and it shouldn't take that much public outrage to change that. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, again, people, you should be outraged by this. Your, law, your elected representatives are negotiating with big companies over how much of your money they're going to collect. This should be outrageous. The fact that they're doing this outside of public scrutiny, that they're doing this with non-disclosure agreements, ought to be over the line. This uh, clearly over the line. Yeah, it's just uh, and obviously I, corrupt, right? There's no, yeah. there's no two ways about it. It's a, it's an elected official signing a binding contract with a private corporation. It's just on its face corrupt. Yeah. There's just no two ways about it. And and as as you've done, you've been working to try to get legislation introduced that does something about this. And when that legislation is heard or it comes to a vote, it is yet to get any opposition. So let's bring these things up for a vote. I mean, or at least let let uh, uh, if if you are a citizen who is upset by this, as uh, as I am, and in, in addition to being a uh, someone who works in the policy world, upset by this, uh, I really hope there's more attention driven this because that's fundamentally what is going to drive this issue. We still live in a world where popularity matters, where people's voices matter. And, and and it matters a lot on the state level. And so just a little bit more attention, I think we can we can get this thing. Uh, and to your point, it really doesn't take a lot. A, a like state representative office hearing from, you know, 45 people is really, really meaningful. Yeah. Um, so I guess what do you see the future uh, of this issue being? We're going to keep fighting. I think I think the momentum is our way. I think you know, I've been working on these issues for, for a bit now, and, and I do feel cautiously optimistic. I think the general knowledge amongst the population of how economic development works at the state level is increasing in a way that's going to be helpful for folks like you and me. I think the knowledge amongst lawmakers uh, is going up in a way that's going to be helpful uh, for folks like you and me. I think pre-HQ2, the idea that a bill banning NDAs in these deals would pass any state legislative chamber was like silly nonsense. And now again, it's come unanimously twice out of the New York State Senate. Um, so that gives me some hope. 
the assembly is still a tough nut to crack, so maybe it'll be some other state that does it first. Um, but yeah, cautious, cautious optimism as long as we just keep pressing it and pressing it and pressing it. Pat, good luck with your efforts to shift the Overton window.